Welcome to the Dice Towers Summer Spectacular, a five-day streaming event with top ten lists, live plays, a host of board game fanatics, and more. All right, welcome everybody to the Dice Tower. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. Good morning, y'all, and welcome to what day? Three of our summer spectacular. I'm still awake, barely. Wait, but you I'm haven't here. slept since we began? No. <laughs> that is that is irresponsibly dangerous. But I did drive home last night, go to bed, get up, drive back here. So there you go. I'm just I'm just going. But good things are going on. So a couple things, folks. First of all, uh, if you want to see who won all the contests on the Dice Tower, you can check that out. It's on our website, dicetower.com. And we'll have more contests. In fact, let's get things kicked off with a contest right now. Right. This is for a copy of Hell, The Last Saga. This was just kickstarted on Kickstarter from Mythic Games. Did slightly okay, if you may have noticed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the... Uh, our gods are dead. Survive, explore, fight, and solve the mysteries of a hostile island in this narrative one to four player Viking survival horror board game. That's right. So if you want to win a copy of this game, which is worldwide here, just email us at contest at dicetower.com. The keyword, the subject line, put hell, H E L, just one L. And then in the description, put your name and address. And then come back to Dice Tower tomorrow. To see if you've won. Speaking of winning, congratulations to Kyle Wood, who won his own personalized dice person with a winning bid of $364.83. <laughs> so, that being said, if you want your own dice person, the money raised here goes to the dice tower. Um, we're doing one each day to, to bid on this. It could be any amount, honestly. You just email us. Um, at auction at dicetower.com and just put your bid there. I would make it in some weird number like that one was 364.83. Um, but you never know. I mean, maybe 11 cents will get it for you if no one else comes in. That's Z sends that bid in every day, 11 cents. I'm like, mm -hmm. tomorrow I might do 12 cents. That's true. It's tricky. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, a game they play every year at one of the conventions we go to where you pick a number. And everyone throws a number in, and whoever picks the lowest number that no one else picks wins. Right. It's so, a really think, neat, it, it kind of like a neat uh, experiment. The lowest unique number, yeah. Yeah, and it's different every year. Like one year it was 13, I think. One year 37. Uh, it's, you know, it could be whatever. I always, yeah, that's, that's cool. I, I always try to go super low, and I'm like, maybe no one else will, will think to go this low. Anyhow, those are the different things that are going on uh, here. Uh, let me see. I'm checking. We did the contest. We talked about the dice person that, that people can bid on. We, there's a lot of stuff coming up today. Tonight, the Dice Tower Awards. We're excited to announce them. But let's get into the news. All right, so let's start here. The first piece of news I'm excited about is we are partnering with the Spiel. Spiel Digital, of course, all cons this year essentially have been canceled, and the Spiel's doing Spiel Digital. Well, there's many different partners. You can read about that all over the internet. We're going to be partnering with them and playing games live on our channel. So the different games that are being released at Essen, we're going to be playing several of them live over the course of the event, which games, when, well, that more information will come about that later as time goes by. But I am excited about this. They've showed me some of the uh, the portals and web pages they have for this, and it looks really cool. Awesome. So, this is fantastic. All righty. So I'm going to just run through a few announcements that we made on Wednesday, in case you missed them, or Tuesday, I guess, when we started, in case you missed them. Dice Tower has a newsletter going now, Dice Tower Digest. Um, which if you can just go to Dice Tower Digest and subscribe to that. comes out every other week. We have T-shirts that you can get for the Dice Tower, both 
superhero t-shirts, summer spectacular t-shirts, or even a Dice Tower East t-shirt, and you can pretend you went to the first Dice Tower East that never actually happened. <laughs> I'll be getting one of those at some point. Yep. Um, and then we have a, our Dice Tower News podcast has rebranded. If you never listened to it and you want to find out about the news, Dice Tower Now. You can go there, subscribe to the podcast, and listen to weekly news podcasts about the board game industry. Then we had a few people join the Dice Tower. Ella Loves Board Games is coming on board to help do previews of Kickstarters and things like that. And Our Family Plays Games uh, will be doing reviews for the Dice Tower. Not only are they doing reviews for the Dice Tower, but tomorrow they're joining us for a top 10 list of top 10 family games. Yes. So very excited about that. Yes. Speaking of news, Our Family Plays Board Games was on Good Morning America. That's huge. One of the things that always irritates me is when one of these big news things says, hey, let's do board games. Here's some board games you should buy. Have you ever heard of this game called Monopoly? And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, I want to smack them. But this is, and if you, you can watch the video, it was really well done. I am so excited about this. They did a yeah. great job. Fantastic. Yeah. So this is, I did not realize this, but this, soon we're coming up to the 100th anniversary of the U.S. suffrage movement in America. And so there's a couple games about that that are coming out. So first one is The Vote, Suffrage, and Suppression in America. This is from Holland Spiel. Holland Spiel makes pretty small print runs of games. They've done some war games. I think you've seen a few of them the, come through the studio. Right, right, sure. So it's about voting, and one player is equality, <laughs> and the other person is supremacy. It seems like I don't know that I would want to be the supremacy player. Hmm. Like That would be hard to role play, right? Like, Stay in your place, you know. I, right, I, I sure, would feel really sure. weird about that. I mean, but I think it's play more of the, a, the games that that feature historically, uh, you know, antagonists do exist, but it seem if you to choose to play that side, and then, like you said, to sort of be silly about it or liven it up. Maybe it's just it's a kind of game that tiptoes the line between being a game and a teaching tool, which is important, just as important, you know. Uh, oh, no, I, I don't disagree. I'm just saying on a personal level, it would be weird to play that 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 role, that's all. And then there's yeah. another game coming uh, from Fort Circle Games called Votes for Women. It's a one to four player game, 45 to 75 minutes. Not a whole lot of information, but it's a card driven game covering the women's suffrage movement from 1848 to 1920. It ends when the 19th Amendment is ratified. So it has competitive, cooperative, and solitaire play, which always makes me nervous, sure. but we'll have to wait and see. Again, someone's pro-suffrage and someone's anti-suffrage. Unless you're playing solitaire, then you're pro-suffrage. So maybe I'll just play that one solitaire. Yeah, it seems like the kind of, you know, this one tries to do everything, but but... With this theme, with this approach, it kind of seems like they should be cooperative games, right? I mean, games in which you are playing just the pro votes for women side of this argument. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to see how these shake out. All right. Ravensburger has announced Game Inventor Days. This is their, this is happening actually in. June, July 10th, 11th, so not too long. Inventors of games around the world, and we often, in America, we call them game designers, but in Europe, they often call them game inventors. Uh, which, yeah, same thing. And you're going to submit your designs online by July 8th. That's next week. So they're looking for all sorts of different games. And so you're, they're going to then schedule half-hour calls with selected designers. Then you could send in prototypes, and then you'll get feedback, and you might get an offer to publish your title. Pegasus Spiel did this in May, um, but this is now happening from Robinsberger. So if you have an idea, a game you want published, there you go. Speaking this of is contest, interesting. This is like an interesting, the, you know, the Game Inventor days. Uh, the, now this is the second one, like you said, in a fairly short amount of time. It's an interesting push. I know these things happen, but... 
I wonder if this goes hand in hand with uh, what's going on in the world right now. There is a reason for it. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah, I do like their logo. It's beautiful. So speaking of contests, Heidelbear, mm-hmm. Heidelbar, sorry, is looking for a robot for the game Volt. I like Volt, designed by Emerson Matsuchi. Uh, this is a fun robot programming game, but they are letting you submit robot drafts. You have up to July 17th, and they will make a 3D miniature of the winning one. That's really cool. Could you imagine winning that? That'd be neat. And, and you don't have to be like a 3D modeler. They said you could just draw a sketch, build something with household items, make a blueprint, whatever works easier for you. They just need to know what the robot should look like. It does not have to be pretty, which is true. Robots are there to be functional, not beautiful. Okay. All right, Ravensburger has announced another character from Marvel Villainous. So they've revealed four of the villains, maybe five. I, I don't know. They've re- So we have Thanos, Hela, Ultron, and Killmonger. Um, and then, so this is a villainous. It's a, it's a, basically the same game as Disney villainous, although I believe they are not compatible at all. Right. Right. And they have released the final one. I believe, um, they've already set them all. So the last one is Taskmaster. Oh, Taskmaster. Okay. That's because he's the new villain in Black Widow. That's right. Movie, right. So, yeah. Alrighty, Pokemon Go is made by a company called Niantic, and they are making a new game. We've mentioned this eons ago, Catan World Explorers. So they already made Pokemon Go and Harry Potter Wizards Unite, where you walk around everywhere and do stuff. Now there's a Catan one. You're collecting brick, lumber, grain, ore, and wood to trade with other players, build settlements in the cities. Wow. This one is... This one's a really tough one for me to understand the draw to it. Like Pokemon Go, I get because you're going around and you're finding Pokemon and you're looking for those rare ones. You might find them somewhere. Right. I don't know that I get the same excitement. Like, I found straw. I don't know. Um, I mean, Katana's very popular. Unique buildings and shapes that maybe you unlock by going somewhere specific. Uh, uh, it's this is very intriguing. This is the first I'm hearing of this, and it sounds very intriguing. But I agree. I'm not sure the the player base will ultimately be there. Well, here's the thing. I think they might be there, and people will show up and play it because Catan's a popular game. But will they stay there? Mm-hmm. Like Pokemon Go is still going. F- Fairly strong, not like it was. You remember when it first came out? It actually came out around this time. It was at one of the Dice Tower conventions, and people were walking around like, oh, catch I'm like, and we went to that Gen Con. Everybody was playing it. You and I were playing it. Yeah. And then, I don't know. No, don't, don't, no, don't include me in this. I don't know what you're talking about. I yeah. do not engage in children's <laughs> I was, activities. I was sitting there going, why? I'm, I'm not playing this game. Why should I play this game? And we were at a dinner and everybody else was playing. I was like, fine, I'll just download it, see what happens. And then I played it for the rest of Gen Con for a couple months afterwards. And then it kind of just faded off the scene. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter still plays it, but even she's playing it, I think, very rarely. Alrighty, Apollo. This is an official NASA board game based on actual moon missions. And it has uh, Jonathan Gilmore is involved with it. So it looks like it's finished. Um, Pandasaurus games and Buffalo games are involved. I don't know a whole lot more than that. But that's kind of neat because, you know, I would figure if, if NASA was making an official game, it would not be that good of a game. But... Yeah. Sarah Addison and Jonathan Gilmore are the co-designers of it. Jonathan says Sarah's the lead designer, so that's pretty cool. I'm looking I'm looking forward to this. I hope it's good. I love this theme. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of it, so I'm excited for this one. I am also. I like the idea of NASA. It's a, just a neat aspect. All righty. Well, I am super excited about this next game. The new CGE game has been announced. Um, uh, we 
already they've already announced one of their games that's coming out, which is under Falling Skies. We know this because Z just played it two days what? ago. This one? This is just a prototype. It's okay. Don't uh, worry. You'll get your own soon enough. But they have another title coming out, a one-to-four-player game called Lost Ruins of Arnak. And you can go online and look at the trailer and they talk about the game. It looks pretty cool. It combines deck building and worker placement with the exploration theme, which I wish was used more in games. I know. So that cover looks pretty cool. The actual game itself looks pretty neat. CG usually puts out some pretty strong designs each year. I These are new publishers, Elwin and Min, Min and Elwin. They don't have, like, last names, maybe? New um, designers, you mean. Not new publishers. New designers, yeah. New designers. Sorry, new designers. Min and Elwin, it's like they both just use one name. That happens sometimes when um, they only work together. Like I know the the two fellas who designed uh, that war game that came out from uh, Devil Pig. I forget what it's called now. But you know what I'm talking about with the tiles. Those fellas only go by their first names because they always work together. Sure. Oh, it's interesting. It's um, so it's coming out later this year. Board Game Geek says this is 60 to 120 minutes. And there's not a whole lot more that they're talking about right now, but I'm excited because I always get excited usually about the big box CGE release that comes out. So Yeah, that cover's doing it for me. I'm I'm digging the vibe. All right, in the industry, a couple of changes in personnel. Bicycle games, who, by the way, are one of the sponsors here of Summer Spectacular, and you'll see us playing some of their games uh, tomorrow, the exchange and Alpha, uh, they've hired Will Wheaton as their ambassador. Will Wheaton has kind of taken a break from board gaming for a few years after he stepped down from tabletop. But here he is being a board game ambassador. I'm not 100% sure what that means other than him being the face of Bicycle. But Bicycle is definitely trying to make a big splash in gaming. They're working really hard at it. And, well, I can't see this being bad for the hobby. Yeah. And as Will Wheaton arises... Stephen Bonacore diminishes, well, not really, but he what? stepped down as the president of Stronghold Games. This was announced yesterday here on our show. He'll be working with us a bit at the Dice Tower. We'll talk more about that in the future. Uh, but he is retiring, and Sidney Engelstein will be joining, uh, which is pretty neat because, you know, we've if, if you've been following the Dice Tower, you almost could see a bit of Sidney Engelstein growing up, and now she's here taking a position at Stronghold Games. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, she will be the director of game development. And of course, Stronghold still run by uh, Indie Game Studios with Travis Worthington. So we'll see what happens in the future. Congratulations to Stephen for his retirement. Absolutely. Congrats. And then finally, in news that shakes the internet, as it always does, the newest Stonemaier game is announced. As far as I can tell, this is the only non-expansion that they are publishing this year, and that's Pendulum. Uh, Mr. Stegmeier always uh, codenames his name, so this one was codenamed Sand, and that's because this is a competitive turnless asymmetric worker placement time optimization game. Whoa. So, well, you, it's going to be one of those things that he's going to release a little bit of information every day. The hype for this in two weeks will be so strong that We'll, we'll start doing the news in two weeks, and Pendulum will just crash through the window and be like, talk about me. We'll be like, ah, okay, sir. Ah. That's pretty, that's, that sounds about right. That that sounds like a well, this happened last release. Week. We, we did a top 10, and at the end of our top 10, people were like, tell us about Tapestry. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Tapestry. <laughs> so, <laughs> Pendulum. Now, the fact that there is some real-time elements of this game is unique. That's very divisive, I found, amongst gamers. So we'll have to wait and see what it's like. It's kind of a cool looking cover. Um, yeah, and it says it's from Travis Jones. I don't know that name off the top of my head. Um, so this might be a new designer. Sure. I'm not sure. And like I said, if, if people want to find out it, you can. You'll be spoon fed details. It'll be like, here's a little bit more. Here's a little bit more, and you'll be like, <laughs> give me some more details. So that will happen over the next two weeks. <laughs> now that All is right. not. That is not the only 
uh, piece. Of, that's not the that's the last piece of news we're talking about right now. But we have some other stuff coming. We're going to have a few interviews. This will be a little bit different than our normal board game breakfast. Instead of our game shows, we got a couple interviews here in this thing. So pay attention to those. There's some neat stuff you'll find out. And then we'll be back to close off the show. Oops, in a bit. But let's get to our first interview with a special announcement. One day, Pa decides to go for mushrooms, so he takes a walk in the forest. You see how fast things turned? Near a farm. And then his mind starts to wonder. Freeman's farm. But first, he needed intel to find out where the Brits were, so he went to the agent. Pa! You mean Pa! <laughs> no, Pa! Th this is so stupid! Freeman's Farm, 1777, from Worthington Games, is where the American insurgents finally smashed the British coming into Saratoga. Decisive battle, insurgency. One to two player game, three out of ten in terms of difficulty, and in an hour, victory. The scale is small. You even have a battle board to get close and personal. If you want a bigger picture, again from Worthington Games, Saratoga, 1777, more of a strategic type game. But as he's walking, Pa hits a boulder, trips, and falls in the water, and it makes him think of another game. Fleet Commander Nimitz, the World War II Pacific strategic game, where you take on the whole Pacific shebang, but when you have a battle, you get close and personal on a tactical map. DVG! 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 Having hit his head on a rock, he's a little disoriented and he sees stars. He thinks he's a space marine. Space Infantry Resurgence! Lock and load publishing! This is where marines go take care of bugs in space. And what you get with this game is... 260 counters, 60 mission maps, 1 manual, 181 mobile cards. No cards, I mean. And 45 single cards, 34 unit cards, 160 90 cards unit, 40... And this is a low complexity game and it's a one 3 game! But as he lands on the planet Hades, he gets a message from Earth. The princess that was kidnapped is on the planet. So you gotta escape from Hades, get the princess, and get out. This is a game designed by Dream Team, Herman Lutman, and Fred Manzo. Get the princess, get out. This is a solo opera, awesome, from Holland Spiele. So he saved the princess and was teleported down in a tank on the Eastern Front. Flying Pig Games Old School Tacticals Volume 1 Eastern Front Volume 2 Western Front plus their respective expansions. This is a huge game. You get a large, large humongo map or maps and it's just epic. You get epic battles. Epic. All right, epic, epic. All that from a walk in the woods and... Yep, all that from a walk in the woods. Next week, I think I have to go into the city. Imagine what's going to happen then. You want to know more about war games? Check out my channel on YouTube. No enemies here. Wargaming news. Adios. Rock, paper, scissors mechanic in a game is one in which it's going to kind of mirror the, you know, the kids game rock, paper, scissors. So our, you know, paper beats rock, rock beats scissors, scissors beat paper. So there's going to be different advantages and disadvantages in the cards or the, car or the powers in the game. A game like Village Pillage is going to have different colored cards and depending on whatever is listed on the bottom of the card, that's going to show whenever you play a card against someone, maybe <clears throat> your red card is going to wall uh, the yellow card or the you know the blue card is going to stop the green card or something like that. So it's going to be like head-to-head uh, -head type challenges with strengths and weaknesses. Jordan Plays Blue is my Instagram page. You guys should um, come and follow my Instagram page. I'm going to show you a little bit about it because it is, I don't know, I think it's kind of unique. Um, what I do is I do a series of quickly reviews. So I'll do um, reviews in which I'll summarize the game, I'll have some photography in the game, I will do a little slide uh, with some quick bullet point thoughts on it, and then I'll do a one minute review about the game. All on Instagram, so you just kind of swipe through. I do unboxing videos, I do giveaways, I do just some general photography stuff on Instagram. 
I think it's a lot of, I think it's some good stuff. So if you're interested in that, you should check me out on Jordan Plays Blue. This summer I'm doing publisher spotlights. Each week I'm gonna be highlighting a different publisher, doing some giveaways with them, some interviews, some uh, reviews, previews, Kickstarter, um, previews, that kind of stuff. So if you're into that, you should follow me on Instagram at Jordan Plays Blue. Thanks. Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. So that was Yahtzee Free For All. What do you mean? What, what are you doing? We, we just started. Yeah, but because it's Yahtzee Free For All, we don't have to follow any rules or structure, so I'm starting at the end. No, but we're doing a second. For, they need to know what's happening. That's they're... how you play. That's how what plays? First but, thing you do, roll what some are you dice. Doing? This is not how This is not how Take works. Take chips. People need to know I'm how to Mike. play the game. You are. I'm, I'm Nick This Thrift like... Store Throwbacks. <laughs> What are you doing? Here's how you play the game. <laughs> All right, so this is Yahtzee Free For All, a truly bonkers board with an equally insane rule book. The way this is gonna go is on your turn, like most Yahtzee games, you're gonna roll these five dice and you have up to three rolls to get something. Now, unlike normal Yahtzee, now you're gonna try to get something that matches one of the three cards, or of course you can always get a Yahtzee. You can save some dice from roll to roll and things like that, or re-roll everything. You have up to three rolls to try to hit something that matches a card. If you did, in this case, I got two fives. I can now take these along with my other dice and put these on my home. But I don't necessarily get this card because on my opponent's turn, they get to roll their dice. And if they manage to get more fives than I roll, they could just actually steal my card instead of taking something from the center. If, however, it makes it back to your turn and this card still hasn't been claimed by anybody else, you get to then bank it and get the points at the end of the game. The other cool thing that happens is if you bust and don't get anything from the middle, everything is going to get a chip on it, making the cards in the center more enticing because these are all worth a point and they're instantly safe as soon as you grab that card that gets instantly banked. That is, in general, how you play Yahtzee Free For All. Here's the thing. Good on them for the... Just going for it. Like, let's make a weird box. Let's make a weird rule book, real weird board. They were <laughs> into it. Now, this thing I had to actually tape down because it's been curled up so long. Uh, it's like a spider. For, like, for an implementation of Yahtzee, sure. I don't why not? hold like, like, a lot of love for Yahtzee anyway. So this no. whole thing where now you have, you're trying you to fulfill certain You can steal stuff. Cards. You have this weird kind of like home base thing. Like, why not? Yeah. Like, I'm down. Honestly, like as far as Yahtzee goes, like, why not? It, this is a cool this looking box, This is a unique box, that doesn't like, work on shelves at all. Let us know down in the comments what you think of this Near weird Blade, Yahtzee Free For All. But Mike, isn't it as cool? That's not is the only Yahtzee, kind of Yahtzee that Texas exists. Hold them? So Some next week, we're talking about this Yahtzee game. We're having a Yahtzee extravaganza over here. So that's it for us, everybody. If you enjoy uh, the Brothers Murph and things like that, check out our channel, and we'll see you next week for some uh, Wild West Yahtzee. That's right. Hey, everybody. We are taking another break here to talk to another famous designer. In fact, one of the most famous designers in the world, Vlada Kovato, uh, from CGE Games, who has designed many, many games. Uh, actually, what was the first game you ever designed that was published? And that was published, probably, uh, that was Arena. Arena Moriturite Salutant, uh, which was fighting, fighting game. And yeah, that was, it was some special game. There was cards and uh, the dice and absolutely no randomness in this game. Oh, wow. So this was, this was quite a while ago because you've been designing games for, for many years now. And one of the games that everyone first found out about you, because nowadays, in many games, people know you from, but probably still your most famous game is Through the Ages. And when Through the Ages came out, I don't know, was it 15 years ago? It's, it's been a while since Through the Ages has come out. Uh, yes, it's like 14 years, yeah. So what was the... what To, to, to make a civilization game is a very big thing. So much work. What made you decide to do it? Uh, you know, that's, uh, I didn't decide that I will publish uh, such a big game. I just wanted to create it. I was actually doing even bigger games before. But I, I did them for my friends. I had a game that was for 11 people, and we played all day. Yeah, And, you know, uh, I, was, I was fascinated by big big games like uh, Blood Royale or uh, The History of the World or uh, Avalon Hill Civilization. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I loved uh, video games and I was working with the video game industry. So 
Yeah, uh, and I remember I uh, I created some. Uh, I started to create some version of civilization, and then then I learned, hey, there is Sid Meier's civilization. It was around 2000, and there was some version of Sid Meier's civilization. So I just stopped and said, okay, I don't need to do it. It's it's already done. Then right. I played it, <laughs> and I said, um, <laughs> maybe I should return to the design. And then I created uh, some game, and my uh, my friends. Uh, it was just as I said for my friends. Uh, I didn't know that it will get published later, um, but I was not really happy about how uh, how it works. Uh, my friends liked it, but, but yeah, I wanted to change a thing or two, and I came with another solution for something in the game. Of, uh, and then I built different game around the solution, and that was through the ages. But so it was. So, my, it is my second civilization game. One of the things I've always wondered is one of the unique things about uh, through the ages is there's no board, there's no map, right? It's 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 probably the only civilization game I know that has no map. How did you make that decision? Uh, I think that map actually makes uh, very difficult for the game to be fair. If you play multiplayer civilization, uh, or maybe there are now better multiplayer, more fair multiplayer versions, uh, but uh, back then uh, it was so big difference. If you start uh, with uh, cattle or wheat or something like this, uh, or if you start in some swamp uh, and uh, hostile environment, and that's one thing. Uh, it could be balanced. Uh, I was really surprised that uh, the, this uh, Sid Meier's Civilization I mentioned from this uh, around 2000 uh, uh, was not solving this too. It was really some some had plague there and some they had some wonderful land there. Yeah, uh, it can be balanced by diplomacy, of course. And that's another thing. Uh, it's very hard to create a a game with map that is uh, not uh, heavily about diplomacy. And hmm. I, when I was young, actually the big game I was talking about was two-dimensional diplomacy uh, thing and so on. I, I loved these things before, but after some time as a gamer, I was kind of, uh, I had enough of them because they are all the same. All diplomatic games are the same for me now, because because there can be different mechanics and so on. But in the end, it's about a hey, if we two will fight each other, then he will benefit, and someone needs to stop him, and I don't want to be the one that stops him and uh, destroys my chance to win and so on. And it's this meta game is uh, is same in most of these games, and mm. uh, I didn't want to do this uh, again. Not that this is bad. I, I remember how much I enjoyed it before. Uh, uh, but uh, I just, uh, as I've said, I had enough of this. And with map, it is almost always about this. It's very hard to avoid. So, so that was my decision. Hmm. So, so when you made the game and you have all these different cards, and you mentioned one of the reasons you didn't have a map was because of balance. How do you balance? There's so many cards and leaders and things. How do you make sure that it's balanced and fair? Uh, there are two things. The cards don't need to really be perfectly balanced. Uh, mm -hmm. There should be just enough balance because uh, recognize which cards are stronger or weaker is part of the skill in the game. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but, but it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can balance it to some... Uh, player style, for example. If I could balance it for myself, then I could uh, uh, know it is balanced when uh, when uh, there is some offer of starting leaders and wonders, and I don't know which one to take, because I think they are all good. Yeah, But right. this is not like this, because there are different styles of game, and some, uh, some uh, leaders and wonders uh, are for heavy military, some for economical games, some for uh, some for uh, like uh, early culture and so on. So uh, the only way uh, how to balance it was to play it a lot. 
uh, for the first version of To The Ages, I created uh, some online version and we played with my friends, uh, with Peter Murmak that we, <laughs> we created later, Czech Games Editions, uh, found it together. Uh, we, uh, and with other people, with Philip, uh, his brother, and, uh, and so on, uh, we played uh, several hundreds of, hundreds of games uh, uh, over internet. And we kind of understood the game uh, uh, because of this, but it was not enough because we it was still a limited group and we had our own style. Uh, that was like there's some group thing about this. So uh, when we were creating the new version, we had much broader uh, testers, uh, tester uh, base. Uh, and we had people that already played thousands of games of through the ages uh, uh, through board gaming online. So it was it was much like a, a better tool for balancing. This is really interesting. There's so much playtesting in this. So there is a new expansion uh, out coming here through the ages, the the new leaders and wonders, and there's. At, you know, of course, new leaders in this game. And there was quite a few leaders in the original game. There's so many people in history. How do you pick which leaders to put in the game? It's, it's tough. There was much bigger uh, amount of leaders. I was uh, testing and uh, toying with and uh, like thinking about. Uh, but uh, for the original game, it was easy. For the original game, it is completely random. I just whoever came to my mind, I put him into the game uh, because I had no idea I will publish the game and I didn't care. Uh, now, uh, with, the, with the expansion, I wanted to fix some things, uh, like that uh, some cultures are not enough represented, uh, there was not enough uh, women uh, uh, yeah, uh, in the original game, female leaders. Yeah, so... I tried to make things a bit better in this aspect, but in the end, it was again about uh, playability. There was some, there were some leaders. I really was thinking that deserve to be in the game, but they uh, gameplay-wise, it was not that interesting. So I went with others that uh, felt that uh, uh, they deserve it too. But uh, I mean, uh, I just picked by gameplay in the end again. Now, this game's coming out, like I said, very soon. Is there anything else you can tell people about the expansion? Is it just more stuff? What what what's what excites you about this expansion? Yeah, that's more stuff. But the point is, uh, it is uh, more stuff. Uh, to 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 uh, there was some fixed set of leaders and wonders, and this is not that I add some stuff. Uh, I replace randomly part of the stuff because the most common way how to play expansion is with a random set of leaders and wonders. Uh, so uh, this is not more of the same, but it is like uh, much more variability now. Uh, because before you had some strategies, uh, you always knew that uh, Napoleon will came sooner or later, and you always knew that this combos with this and so on. Uh, but now uh, these combos are different in each game, and uh, there is some mechanics how you see in advance uh, which cards will be in the game, and uh, if you if you really like what, if you really want to play well, you need to take this in, in account. And the game, uh, every game before every game was different because of order in which the cards came. Yeah, you couldn't really plan uh, in the ages, but now uh, this uh, this setting is variable. So uh, I think that's the biggest difference. Uh, of course, it's also the particular cards uh, bring some uh, new mechanics and uh, new combinations and so on, but what's most important is that now uh, uh, the, uh, every game is really different. I'm looking forward to playing this, and it's interesting because we can you can buy both the physical game. There's also a very good app that you can play this uh, with, and so we have this new expansion coming out. 
Uh, do you think that this is like the end of the 4X genre for you, the Civilization games? Or maybe we'll see something in the future? Um, I never say never. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, I spent so much time with Through the Ages. Uh, and I put everything I uh, wanted to. I think that I am not inclined to do the same thing again. But uh, as I said, never say never. <laughs> uh, I think I think that uh, I may have, uh, uh, like uh, because there is so many people that play uh, to the ages now. They play it in the app. Uh, the expansion is, by the way, uh, out for nine or eight months uh, in the app. Right. Uh, so so. Uh, so there is so many people that uh, it's it makes sense to keep improving stuff, yeah, uh, for them. Well, we certainly look forward to see what comes forward in the future, folks. This expansion is coming out very soon. You definitely, if you've never played through the ages, you definitely want to check it out. It's a fantastic game, the closest game, in my opinion, to actual Sid Meier's Civilization, uh, which is one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, thanks so much. Vlada for coming on and talking to us and I really look forward to seeing what you design in the future okay thanks nice to talk with you goodbye Hi, everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, well, today we're going to be talking about Birdie. This is a game all about disc golf. So, as some of you know, we like to talk about what we're trying to do to achieve better health. And one of the things we like to do is play disc golf. Disc golf, I've heard described as hiking with a purpose. So, if you're somebody who wants to get up there, but you find walking incredibly boring, or even hiking incredibly boring, I think disc golf might be your jam. So, basically, what you're doing is, is you're going on this hike. You are throwing these discs, trying to complete, you know, a hole in as few strokes as possible. The player with the fewest strokes wins. Uh, so basically what the Boda Brothers have done is they have translated that into a board game. You are rolling these these dice, these D10s, these D20s, these D6s, in an effort to try to move your disc along the board and try to complete these holes in as few strokes as possible. It is a ton of fun and it is just cool to see all those little inside jokes and all those little disc golf isms um, all thrown together in this game. Yeah, this game kind of reminds me of an RPG. At the very beginning, before you even play the course, you're kind of building up your character and their stats. Your, um, you spend five rounds drafting things to put on your character to make their abilities stronger or to be able to use to mitigate your dice rolls or just to get more dice for your dice rolls. Yeah, we've been enjoying it. I think they did a great job of kind of bringing everything together, both as a disc golfer and as a board gamer. We've been really enjoying Birdie. Yeah, disc golf is a sport that we really enjoy, and it's fun to see it implemented well in a game. All right, so if you want to see our full thoughts, be sure to check out our full review. You can find us on YouTube or on Facebook. We are Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. So everybody, this is Ryan and Bethany, hoping you have a happy, healthy breakfast. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. In this segment, we take a look at a game based on IP, and I tell you if the mechanisms and the IP mesh very well and whether you should keep the game or not. Today, we're going to look at Back to the Future, Dice Through Time, and I'm going to show you how it plays, and I'll come back and tell you what I think. Here's Dice Out of Time all set up. A few things you have moving on. All players will lose if the Out of Time marker gets to the end. The players are trying to deliver all of these items to their locations. In this case, I need to go to Hilldale in 2015, and I need to deliver this item. When I do deliver all these items, all the players will win the game. In the meantime, Biff is going to be moving around the board in order to try to prevent us from delivering these items. We will also have these events out that if we don't take care of, will move the track up and cause us to lose the game and come closer to not fixing the issues. Rolling the dice and what icons you get and manipulating dice is what this game is all about. Each side of the dice will give me a different particular action or if I have two matching icons, they can be any icon that I want to be and the wrenches are wild. So I'll be moving through time trying to prevent these events from decimating our chances while also just trying to attempt to deliver these items. I really feel like the IP and what you're doing in the game mesh. Rolling the dice is kind of weird, but moving through time and getting rid of Biff and having to punch him to move him, getting in these fights and traveling and fixing these events, but the events aren't really what you're doing. You have to get the items in the right places in order to accomplish the goal of his parents falling in love. And I think that really works and you're limited on time 
time, which kind of kind of represents you vanishing in the movie. I think it all works really well. The game does have some luck in it. The right cards don't come up or the dice rolls aren't in your favor. You're just going to get hosed on this one. Other than that, I feel like it fit the IP really well. This is a family game that we've had a great time with it. We played it over 10 times already as a family and had a great time. And if you like Back to the Future, currently on the market, I feel like this is the best one to get. Two thumbs up. Love it. It's a keeper and it fits with the IP. Howdy folks, welcome to By The Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from The Family Showdown. This episode, we're continuing my Through the Year series by looking at the best game on Board Game Geek by year. Started in 1970, this time 1996. Taking a look at the top five from 1996, we see the number one game is Hannibal, Rome vs. Carthage. Coming in at number 210, but it's the 15th best war game. Hannibal, Rome vs. Carthage is an asymmetrical two-player war game that uses multi-use cards to simulate the battle between Hannibal versus the Roman Republic circa 200 BC. Take a look at the ratings, almost 4,700 of them. We see lots of eights and then a nice lovely little bell curve around the eights for an overall rating of 7.8. Take a look at the weight, it comes at a 3.44, which seems about right for a war game I know absolutely nothing about. I'm still itching to play my first, like, real war game, you know, what the, the war gamers call a war game. This could be the one. It has a Roman theme. I might be able to rope Rebecca into playing this one. Maybe not. See you next time. Hey folks, we're taking a break here from our board game breakfast to bring you an interview with one of the hottest Kickstarter companies out there, Mythic Games. Welcome to the show, Leo. Thank you, Tom. And for a lot of people probably don't know who you are. Could you tell us who you are and what you do with Mythic? Yes, well, uh, I'm one of the two co-owners of Mythic Games. I have a, a partner and I usually do uh, communication. You know, uh, during the lives, I do presentations uh, of uh, our games. So I'm a sort of creative director and communication. This is my role. <laughs> you also might not know, he tends to hire former Dice Tower employees to work for him. Um, so Mythic has, <laughs> is, is known for sure for their thematic games, right? You open a box, you're not, no one thinks, uh, this is kind of abstract. You know, where does that passion for theme come from? It's always been there. You know, I come from role-playing games. so. I've always had a taste for strong story, uh, immersive universes, and so on. So we brought that. But I also come from uh, tabletop miniatures games, so, because I like the beauty of the miniatures. So you mix that, and this is what we do with Mythic Games. So beautiful, immersive games with uh, also uh, spectacular uh, miniatures and visuals. Well, you mentioned miniatures, and that's obviously something that you're known for. The Joan of Arc put that front and center. How do you go about finding the, the miniature? Like, is, do you have, like, an idea in your head? What do you want it to be? A lot of people don't know how miniatures happen. Well, because I have this experience uh, of, of miniatures, not only as a gamer, but also because I used to be a, a journalist uh, and... I run several magazines, including a miniatures one, so I know exactly how the process goes. And uh, we simply used uh, what the best people in the industry did. So how it works is you first come with a universe. So you have a strong universe uh, that you're an exciting one that you have your 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 mind uh, into. You know, you really know what you want. And then you do concept art, and this is all coming from there. And for that, you use uh, the best artists, uh, and we've, we've used a renowned a world artist for our concept art because it really makes a difference in the end. So you start from this concept art, and then you have them uh, digitally sculpted because it used to be uh, manually sculpted or digital, and now it's almost fully digital because there's too many uh, advantages of going digital. So. Uh, you go from a concept, uh, we have uh, uh, some art directors that are very, very good at it. We will say, please change this or that. When we have a concept art that we like, we turn it into a miniature uh, through uh, with, with, with a computer, uh, through a render. Uh, we make some changes and then we also print them because we want to see it printed because 
the way it looks in the end is different than what it would look uh, just as a render. We make sure that it looks like a miniature that you can see all the details uh, in real size uh, on your tabletop, and this is how we work. Now, we mentioned theme earlier. One of the things I find interesting with your games is you often, for many of your games, you take a real-world theme. So, for example, Joan of Arc or Reichbusters, you have World War II. But then you bring in some mythological elements to it. So Joan of Arc has a dragon. Mythbusters has zombie-type creatures. Real and so on. Yeah. You're absolutely right, Tom. And actually, our first game was exactly like that. It was Mythic Battles Pantheon. Uh, it was the Greek mythology, and we added like something uh, uh, post-apocalyptic uh, in, in the first. But yes, it's mythology, but revisited. Uh, and then Joan of Arc, uh, what if... Uh, uh, it's the Hundred Years' War, it's his historical, but what if the beliefs the, the, what uh, people had at that time really existed, like ghosts and uh, uh, devil and, and angels, uh, and if everything was there? Uh, and same with Rashbusters, uh, what if the Nazis had found uh, uh, this energy uh, that could change the course of the war? Uh, yes, we've, we've, we've always uh, done something like that. And even with our uh, upcoming game like Solomon Cain. Uh, it's set in the 16th century, but evil is there, and is and you have like creatures and so on. We 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 think it's easier for people to relate to something they know, but at the same time we want it to be exciting. So we will always uh, add this little uh, thing. So this is very notably present in the game that just was on Kickstarter, um, Hell, uh, where you see Vikings. But there's also a very strong element of various religions in there. So there's a lot of, uh, do you do a lot of research into that to learn about this? Oh yes, we are all uh, very interested in this. We are interested in uh, religion, in mythology, uh, in history. This is something that we really into, and of course, uh, science fiction and fantasy. So uh, all of those things that we are into, we try to translate them into uh, our games. And for hell, you're absolutely right. This is an important aspect. It's uh, uh, I, not only the Viking uh, theme and uh, myth, mythology, but also the Christian mythology and also the, the wild uh, nature uh, beliefs and something else that I don't want to spoil. <laughs> yeah, this is, a, this is a different kind of game for you because you've done campaign games in the past, but this is one that's a story-driven game to the point where we don't even know what's going to happen because a lot of this has been yet unrevealed. Um, this this Kickstarter was extremely successful for you, um, and Kickstarter has been a, a, a platform that has built your company. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and how you've used Kickstarter to make Mythic go to where it is now? Yes, you're absolutely right. This uh, hell has been our biggest success so far. This is the most recent campaign, uh, and almost 18,000 backers. This is huge, and uh, you know we've been there for four years, uh, and you're right, we've always uh, used Kickstarter as the main source, not only of revenue, but of marketing and the, the sorts of games we wanted to do. Uh, the reason why we went to Kickstarter is because of the games we wanted to do couldn't be uh, distributed in uh, retail because too much material, uh, too pricey. When you, you combine all of the, uh, the different margins, it would simply be uh, prohibitive to sell uh, uh, on retail. This is going to change, uh, however. Uh, we realized uh, over the last year that we really wanted to not only depend on Kickstarter, but to diversify and to start making smaller games that are also suited for uh, uh, retail. And this is how, for instance, Super Fantasy Brawl happened. This is a much smaller scale game, yet very exciting with some nice minis. We put it on Kickstarter, but not in the same way as our former bigger projects like Hell or uh, Joan of Arc. Uh, this one was smaller, it was intended for retail. We put it on Kickstarter and we had like a very, very good success as well. So yes, we've always counted on Kickstarter, but now we're going to retail. And we're going to retail for uh, Super Fantasy Brawl, but also for a card game called Enchanters. Uh, purely card game. We went to Kickstarter with that. It was the first game without miniatures that we did, and it was very successful, uh, and it's going to retail. So we will alternate Kickstarter projects and things that are more uh, suited for retail. 
I've really been enjoying Enchanted. It's been playing it with my kids lately. Um, Super Fantasy Brawl. This is coming out soon, isn't it? Very, very soon. Uh, production is going uh, at the moment, and it will be delivered, hopefully, by the end of the summer or early September for everybody. Uh, there's been a little bit of delay because of the COVID situation, you know, like uh, in China, they're not going uh, full speed. But now it's being produced. Uh, it's We're coming, we're arriving at the end of production. And so, yes, it's coming and we are super excited. Uh, the community can all, already start playing it because it's on Tabletopia for free. People can play and try the game and it's, even these games have been very successful, so we're anticipating uh, a very strong response. All right. Well, lastly here, um, I guess I should ask about the future. What, what might we see coming from Mythic Games in the future? Well, we've just announced, uh, because people have been asking us constantly, what will be next? What will be next? So we said, you know, we don't want to say... Now, because we're really focused on uh, delivering uh, Super Fantasy Brawl uh, Solomon Kane, which is also in production, and Enchanters, which will go to production uh, in the first two weeks of July. So it's coming soon, too. So we were really focused on that. We didn't want to uh, tell them. Now, and with you, <laughs> we've started announcing uh, for the first time what will be our next Kickstarter. It's only going to happen at the end of the year, probably fall. And we've just signed... Uh, a licensed game uh, with Darkest Dungeon. Darkest Dungeon is a video game, uh, an indie video game uh, that has been extremely popular. Uh, there are big fans out there, but just the game itself, the universe and the atmosphere is just awesome. And we, we won't tell you too much for now, but we can just say that this is our next one. All right, we're looking really forward to seeing that come out. We're looking forward to seeing the final products. Uh, folks, you can even uh, the, you can play, of course, Joan of Arc, Mythic Battles, uh, Enchanters is out there, Reichbusters. So we look forward to seeing what comes out soon. I'm really pumped about uh, Super Fantasy Brawl uh, coming soon. So uh, thanks, uh, Leo, for coming Thank on the show. Tom. Thank and you have, very much. Have a great day. <laughs> have a great day. Bye-bye. All right. Well, that was a different board game breakfast than normal, but I hope you enjoyed those announcements uh, from Mythic there. Um, so speaking of Mythic, don't forget, there's a contest to win a copy of Hell. All you got to do is email us at contest at dicetower.com and put Hell as your subject, your name and address in the body. And if you're just tuning in now, you see all these dice people that we have as our logos. You yourself can get one. We're having an auction for that. Just email your bid to auction at dicetower.com. And we'll announce the highest bid each day and that you'll get your own very own drawn dice person. Of course, this is for non-commercial use, but just that you can have fun using them. Nice. All righty. We're going to drop off here for a bit. We're going to be back at 1030 playing Cross Clues and Rose Ceremony live. And then you'll see some more playthroughs and stuff. And then later on at one o'clock, no pun included, is going to be joining us for the top 10 convention experiences. And then more live plays later throughout the day and the Dice Tower Awards tonight. But this is the end of breakfast today. So until later, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Zeke Garcia. Thank you. Have fun gaming. <laughs>